everyone, Thanks and thank you so us. much for joining us here today. Hi, everyone. everyone and welcome. I'm Jasmine Enberg, Principal Analyst at Insider Intelligence, and I'm based in LA. Thank you so much for joining us for today's summit, our live virtual event, Attention, Trends and Predictions for 2024. We are kicking things off with our keynote, The Need for Speed, Why Keeping Up with Change is Harder Than Ever, with Zia Daniel Wigder, Chief Content Officer in our New York City studio. Afterward, my colleague Andrew Lipsman, Vice President and Principal Analyst, will join us for a discussion with Sarah Travis, Senior Vice President and President of Roundell. We won't be answering live audience questions in this session, but we still want you to participate. You can use the chat window at the right to submit questions and communicate with your peers. Our backstage team will share the best questions with our Ask the Analyst panel in advance, and they may be asked during that session, which starts at 3.10 p.m. Eastern. Now, there's a few ways for you to navigate this platform and make sure that you're at the latest session throughout the day. On your left is the navigation panel. The sessions button will allow you to navigate to and from sessions. You can also go to the next live session by clicking on the tab below the video named, you guessed it, next session. If you're having any audio or video issues, please look to the tech support tab below the video for help. And now let's get to it. Over to you, Zia. All right. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And thank you to everyone for joining me here today to talk about the need for speed. We've got a few different things we're going to cover during the course of this next half hour or so that we're going to spend together. We're going to talk about consumer attention. We're going to talk about advertising. And we're going to hit on commerce and some of the biggest digital trends transforming these three areas. Now, before we dive in, I want to start off with a few charts. And we're not going to be looking at our own charts here. We're going to get to a lot of those throughout the course of the day. But rather, I'm going to start out with some of the world's most iconic visuals. Now, this first one that I'm going to tee up is kind of considered the granddaddy of data visualization. And this one shows Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812. And this is cited as one of those iconic visuals because in a single glance, you can see just how ineffective this campaign was. In fact, it was one of the lethal, of, most lethal of all times as he returned to the beginning of this invasion in Lithuania, having lost about a half million troops. So a simple look at this visual and you can tell exactly what has happened with a single glance. And it's not just this one area where you've seen some iconic visuals. Others, like global population, can be captured in a single image. So this chart that looked at the APAC population and showcasing the fact that there were more people living inside of the circle as compared to outside of it helped put the global world in context. And even a really simple chart can tell a complex story. So this one will be familiar to many of you. This came from the Shopify blog last summer, or summer of 2022 rather, in which in doing layoffs, they showed that there had been this pandemic acceleration when it came to e-commerce penetration of all retail. You saw it you know, bump up during the course of 2020 and then start to come back to the trend line. So that acceleration that everyone had been talking about proved not to be permanent. And this was used as an explanation why the hiring that they had gone through was not necessarily bringing them to the level that they needed to have longer term. And so all of this brings us to one of the best known line charts of all time. And this is where I'm gonna tee up our need for speed, which is this chart showing the adoption of technologies over time, everything, from the very beginning, when you started to see you know, uh, electricity, you moved all the way to things like the microwave, the washer dryer, all the way to the modern day when you were getting to the adoption of the computer, the internet, cell phones. And you can see in these 15 year increments, just how quickly consumers were adopting the, these new technologies and how much more quickly they were doing it today as compared to what 
we've seen in the past. So it's often used to illustrate this fast technology adoption. But the thing is, not all visuals can last forever. And this is actually a chart that is now outdated. Because if you looked at a lot of the new technology adoption, what you would see is a near vertical line. If you look at some of the recent technology adoptions, they're happening not in a matter of decades or even years, but are a matter of months or even days. So I want to take a minute to tee up this conversation talking about some of those big shifts in adoption. And this is arguably the biggest story of the past year when it comes to technology adoption, which of course is generative AI. And here we're not just talking about the 100 million users that ChatGPT saw coming on board in the matter of two months. These are actually active users of any type of generative AI. So not those that maybe downloaded it and played around with it for a little while, but those that are entering queries at least once a month. And you can see, if you recall the chart before that had those 15 year increments, we're now reaching over a third of the population in just a handful of years. So this is one of those that would be that uh, near vertical line if you plotted it on the technology adoption chart today. Timu, another meteoric rise that we've seen in the past year, launched in the US in September of 2022. This China-backed offering surged in popularity, reaching over 70 million unique visitors and shooting past some of the big, incredibly disruptive players in this space that already existed. Shein, for example, having been one of the most innovative players with their manufacturer to consumer model, their innovative production capabilities, suddenly you've got this new player, which along with an estimated billion plus dollars in marketing spend, was able to capture a lot of consumers' attention in a very short period of time. Now, it's not just all easily downloadable apps that are shifting in terms of how quickly they're being adopted. If you look at something like EVs, electric vehicles, you've gone from zero to an incredibly high adoption rate in a relatively short period of time. And this shows cumulative numbers for Tesla, just as one example. And you can see how that exponential growth started to kick in. But the interesting thing about Tesla is it wasn't in fact their first model that drove this exponential growth. If you look at where it came from, it came almost entirely from the Model Y. So you had that very incremental growth early on with the Model 3, their um, first one launching in the market. But then at the beginning of 2020, they launched the Y, their crossover SUV. And I, like many others, got on the wait list at that point, was waiting months and months for the, our delivery. But within a three-year time frame, they had not only ramped up that production, but it became one of the best-selling models globally. So in that short period of time, it got to the levels of, for example, the Toyota Corolla, which had been at the top of that list. And there's debate over wh whether it's the best selling or just one of the best selling, but it really doesn't matter. What's incredible is that the shift took place, and this was not just an easily downloadable app. This is one that required an entire infrastructure shift for the consumers who are purchasing it. So this need for speed is crossing over into many different areas. And so, yes. Digital markets have always seen rapid change, but the shifts that are happening today are happening faster than ever before. And a lot of leaders just aren't moving fast enough to keep up. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about consumer attention, which is an increasingly scarce resource. So this first set of charts looks at time spent on social platforms, and you see it starting to plateau you're seeing that consumers no longer are spending more and more of their day on social networks. The amount of time they're spending is roughly the amount of time that they're gonna be spending a few years from now. So what this means is that one platform's gain is gonna be another's loss. Yet you're still seeing a shift in the mix that's happening in the market today. You see again, the rise of TikTok, which won't be a surprise to anyone on this call today, but you've seen it surge past Instagram in terms of those you know, cumulative monthly, uh, cumulative minutes. And then you see it also ratcheting past Facebook. Yet what's interesting here is it's not just one player that dominates this space. It is clearly an area where there's not gonna be only a single dominant platform, 
but rather multiple ones that consumers are flocking to. And this chart doesn't even show Pinterest or Snapchat or any of the you know, many other platforms out there. But it is going to be a battle to get consumers increasingly scarce time on these social platforms as you see competitors coming into the market and looking to take up some of this limited time that they are allotting to social platforms. You're also seeing that consumers are spending less time consuming content on each page that they visit. This shows active page dwell time in the US over time. And the data just goes through the beginning of 2022, yet we're continuing to see the same shift. You're seeing the amount of time that consumers are spending on each page, each page continuing to decrease. So you don't have as much time to capture consumers when they come to your page. They're not gonna be looking to spend you know, extended periods exploring. They may in some cases, but in many, they're simply gonna be looking to get what they need and get out. So implications for how you deliver content. And the number of apps that consumers use is decreasing, making it even more competitive to capture their attention. So you can see that the number of apps that they download, as well as the number of apps that they actually use, is continuing to decrease. So this top one showing the apps used per month, the bottom one showing the apps installed per year. You don't have as much opportunity to capture their attention. So this whole idea that consumers' time is precious and that their attention is a limited resource is one that marketers need to keep in mind as they think about how they're looking to attract shoppers, consumers, whomever it might be, to their sites and to their mobile apps. So treat your customers like their time is precious. Take an honest look at where your consumers are spending their time and make sure that your focus is aligned. Make sure that you are following consumers to the places where they are spending that time because it's not simply going to grow as, as multiple players increase their share of the market, that time is going to be limited. And also ensure you're getting consumers what they need quickly. Often they're not in an exploration mindset. They may be at some points, but assume that what they want to do when they get to your site is to get the information they're looking for and then move on to whatever else it is that they're looking to do in their busy days. So that brings us to the second part of our conversation today. There's more competition for ad dollars than ever before. So if you look at the growth of digital advertising, we've entered a slower growth phase, one that is pretty typical in a maturing market. So we saw these increases of you know, double digits for many years. We saw the pandemic bump, just as we saw in that e-commerce share of total retail. But we're now entering an era when growth is gonna be under 10% it's not going to be at that same pace we saw before. And this is very typical with any market that has reached a relative degree of maturity. And within the US, digital now is about three quarters of all ad spending. So it's gotten to a not only a dominant place, but one where it's commanding the lion's share of all ad dollars. So yes, it will continue to grow, but it's not gonna be at quite those same levels that we've seen in the past. And marketers are having to pivot quickly to keep up with those who are seizing new opportunities. This is a chart that Andrew Lipsman, who will be coming on right after me, um, first launched when he talked about retail media being the third big wave of digital advertising. And it very clearly illustrates that you saw that first wave of search with Google dominating. You saw a second wave with meta dominating in social or display. And then at the top, you see the rise of retail media, which, yes, is largely a combination of search and display, but emerged as its own very separate component of the market, where you see Amazon dominating in a way you saw with Meta and Google in the waves before it. In this case, Amazon taking in about 75% of retail media ad dollars currently, but that will change over time. But the thing is, with this slide, what it also shows is just how quickly the adoption of retail media by marketers happened. If you look at the rise of search, it took about 14 years to go from zero to a $30 billion market. If you look at the rise of social, it took just 11 years. And then by the time we got to retail media, that zero to $30 billion happened in just five years. So in the same way we saw consumer adoption starting to, or the timeframe starting to decrease, 
We're now seeing that same thing in terms of adoption of some of these new digital marketing channels. So one where that need for speed is going to be critical as marketers look to ensure that they are following where the growth is. And time spent in ad dollars don't always match up when it comes to all platforms. This is a chart from some of our research that shows the percentage share of time spent with digital as compared to the percentage share of total digital ad spending. And looking at this, it's very clear at the top that there's quite a difference between the amount of time consumers are spending on the meta platforms as compared to the share of ad dollars that are going that direction. And you can look at this in multiple ways. Yes, there is a difference between those two, but this doesn't necessarily mean that those dollars are not being spent in the right place. It means that the targeting capabilities that are being offered on these platforms is you know, exceptional. It means that marketers are very comfortable and are seeing a return on their spending on these platforms. So when you look at this, there are different ways to interpret the data. And the same thing is true of some of the others that we showcase here. When you look at YouTube or Hulu, TikTok, these aren't even all uh, social platforms, you're seeing that the amount of time spent in these cases is higher than the, the percentage of ad dollars that are going to the platforms. So their potential opportunity may be to shift some of the spending there, those directions, but also opportunities for these platforms to better showcase what their capabilities are to try to get those uh, red and black bars closer to each other. And you see the same thing uh, being true in CTV. So here you've got a very dominant player. You've got YouTube taking up about a quarter of all time spent on CTV, also taking about, up about a quarter of ad spending. But what's interesting here is that if you look, for example, at you know, YouTube CPMs, they're about $15 is what we're projecting for the end of this year compared to for Hulu, it's around 25. For others like Netflix or Disney Plus, we're in kind of that $50 range. So big opportunities for some of these other players to monetize their platforms. And indeed, Netflix is very early on in its ad journey. Um, we're just coming up right now on the one year time frame there. But we see um, the dollars going to that platform increasing. Uh, this year, I think we are saying around 700 million or so going to Netflix, but by next year, it's going up to just over a billion. So it is increasing at pretty high percentage rates, but it's not gonna be an instantaneous shift over. There's still a lot of other players and a lot of shifting dynamics in this market beyond just Netflix entering and expanding their ad platform. And then marketers have shown they can adapt to uh, shifting consumer time spent, but it can take many years. So here on the chart, the top one here, whether it's the dark red bar or the dark gray bar shows the percentage of total media ad spending going to that platform. And the lower bar, the light pink or the dark gray showing the percentage of total time spent. And you can see over a 10 year period, you went from mobile having been very much under monetized as a platform with consumers spending you know, a much higher percentage of their time there than what you saw with ad dollars going to the platform. But that shifted. The pendulum swung completely the other direction. So you're now seeing the ad dollars surpassing the time spent. So with all of these new emerging digital platforms, it will be important for marketers to kind of strive more for that equilibrium. You don't need to go to a complete other extreme. And again, there will be different factors going in here um, that will determine where you want that pendulum to fall. But realize that it, that pendulum can shift pretty quickly in the other direction. So striving for middle ground is something that we're going to be looking to see advertisers you know, embracing as a strategy going forward. And so it's a fast moving, sometimes misaligned world. As growth in digital spending slows, one platform's gain is another's loss. And marketers are pivoting and seizing new opportunities faster than they have in the past. So you've got this combination of, you know, the fact that you have a limited amount of time being spent on some of these platforms. We talked about that in the early part of the presentation. And yet marketers you know, are having to shift incredibly quickly to go from one platform to the next. So on the one hand, we've got kind of this plateauing happening. On the other, you need to be shifting quickly. So 
you've got these two different forces happening in the market. And yes, classic delta still exists between time spent and ad spending, just like that mobile example that I showed. Make sure you're taking the time to understand where your marketing investments may be misaligned and ensure that your spending is exactly where you need it to be, given where consumers are spending their time. So now we move to the third and final part of our presentation, which is around uh, e-commerce and digital influenced sales. And this is another one where we're entering a period of intense change. So I showed this chart before, the one that came from the Shopify blog showing the US Census Bureau data indicating e-commerce is a percentage of total retail sales. So you can see it did fall back to the trend line, just as we showed from the summer of 2022 when that first graphic was posted. Yet we're still seeing pretty substantial growth going forward. What I've attached here to the Census Bureau's uh, projections is the forecast that we have for the next few years for e-commerce as a percentage of total retail. So you see it increasing still pretty substantially. You don't see the same exact growth rates that you saw prior to the pandemic, but still really solid and above those that we saw with digital advertising. With the big difference here being the percentage of total retail that is actually shifted online. I talked before about digital advertising and the fact that it now represents about 75% of all media ad spending. With retail, we're talking about only 16% of all sales going online at the moment. And that's pretty different from a number of other big markets globally. Um, probably many of you will be familiar with China, which is approaching half of all sales being digital in that country. But even others like the UK see a penetration level that's twice what we have in the US. It's about 32% there. Or others like Indonesia that are at 28% that have gone well past our 16%. So a lot of runway for growth here if you look at the US in a global context. And in some ways, we're still kind of early on in that adoption curve. And some categories are still seeing a pandemic bump. You're seeing personal luxury beating its pre-pandemic trajectory for e-commerce penetration. So this is one category where you saw that great leap uh, during the pandemic, but that leap upward in terms of the percentage of all uh, sales that are happening online is continuing to you know, increase year over year. Those who are buying luxury online are continuing to do it. Uh, or Those who are buying luxury digitally are continuing to do it. And so they didn't shift back. It was not that sudden you know, pendulum swing back to physical that we saw in some other categories. So one in which there are going to be substantial opportunities going forward. And this is not the only one either. There are others in grocery handful of other categories where you're seeing this same uptick post pandemic. But as you saw for the lion's share, you are seeing those figures coming back to the trend line. And here, the fastest growing categories are building on a smaller base. So we do again hear lots about grocery shifting online. And I agree, this is one of the, you know, the biggest trends in e-commerce today and one that will continue going forward. You see food and beverage being the fastest growing category in US e-commerce, followed by health and personal care. But when you look at where the actual dollars are being spent online today, it's in others. It's in apparel and accessories, which is you know, the largest of the categories that we forecast, or computer and consumer electronics, another mega category that has shifted heavily online, furniture and home furnishings. Food and uh, beverage and health and personal care are having to kind of make up for lost ground. So while they are mega categories, still a very small percentage of total digital sales coming through those two categories. And when we think about this need for speed, it has continued into other areas as well. So this chart is looking at the click to door speed for digital purchases in the US with the top line being for non-Amazon retailers and the bottom one being for Amazon. And we often hear about how Amazon has raised the bar on delivery times. And you can see it very much is the case that other retailers have 
also been increasing how long, sorry, decreasing how long it takes them to get packages from the time they're ordered to that customer's door. So the need for speed may be influenced by one large player, but in many cases, it's also uh, being borne out with others in the market who then have to contend with new consumer expectations. So to wrap up this session, e-commerce opportunities vary greatly by category. There is a long runway for e-commerce growth with food and beverage and health and personal care leading the charge. And you see big opportunities for categories like luxury online. That one that I showed is maintaining its level we saw during the pandemic. And in a category like this, where Amazon is not a big competitor, you know, having despite having tried to enter this space a handful of different times in the past, you're seeing opportunities for players to get in there in a way that they might not be able to in the categories where you've got, you know, Amazon, the you know, the behemoth in the e-commerce space already with a strong presence in that market. And then finally, the need for speed has extended into delivery. So for most retailers out there who aren't in a position to build out their entire delivery networks themselves, partnerships are going to be essential for these players looking to reach consumers and to meet their expectations, given that declining time frame for deliveries. So to conclude here, since I started with charts, I'm going to end with a chart here as well, which is to kind of talk through the three different areas that I discussed and uh, indicate where they would fall on this traditional S curve. So if you look at consumer time spent on digital media, you're really here near the top of this curve. You're seeing it plateau. You're seeing not a whole lot of growth going forward. So one in which I mentioned the zero sum game, one where one platform's gain is gonna be another's loss and it's gonna become hyper competitive to uh, get more and more of consumers time. You look at digital advertising, and I talked about that sub 10% growth that we're going to see now that it's already at a 75% penetration level. That would fall closer to the, the top here or of the upward part of the S curve where it's continuing to grow, just not quite as quickly as what we saw in the past. And then if we looked at e-commerce, so it would be kind of squarely in the middle of this S curve. The fastest growth rates in an S curve typically come just before that middle area. And that's kind of what we've seen here with e-commerce. It is continuing to grow quickly. You'll continue to see that 16% grow within the US. You'll see it while not approaching some of the other countries I mentioned, certainly continuing to increase. So look to see a lot of runway ahead for that area in comparison to some of these other areas in the case of digital advertising, where you've already seen a lot of that shift happen. And with that, I am going to say thank you to everyone for joining me here today. And I am incredibly excited for this next session with Andrew Lipsman and Sarah Travis of Roundell. They are going to be joining us for a fireside chat. So with that, over to you, Sarah and Andrew. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that, Zia. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I'm really excited about this conversation. Now, you alluded to in your presentation uh, the third wave of digital advertising and the telescoping nature in which it's accelerating. Um, it's just beginning, right? It's going to be over $40 billion this year on its way to a hundred billion dollar market in the U S uh, by 2027. So it's only going to further accelerate. And that's why I'm very excited to welcome Sarah Travis. Um, Sarah, thank you for joining us today. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. Super excited to be here. Yeah, well, so you've been at the helm at, at Roundell uh, since mid-2021, obviously during a really exciting time and period of explosive growth for retail media. Um, I'm curious to understand more about what excited you about the opportunity with Roundell and maybe what surprised you the most about this uh, vibrant world of retail media since you embarked on this role. For sure. Yeah. So I started, you're right. It's It's been about two years since I came over to Target. And um, it's honestly just been such a joy and pleasure to be able to take the media experience that I gained throughout my career and be able to take that and apply it into a retailer where, you know, just a retailer I have admired both as a guest and just a student of business and brands for, you know, decades. And so that alone, just like career opportunity of a lifetime. So it's been amazing. Um, I think what I'm most excited about is, um, is thinking about how we continue to unlock 
all of that magic that is Target into our media offerings. And so that starts with, you know, the, the relationship that we have with our guests. I think we've got a relationship that is different and really special. Um, so it's that relationship and our values as an organization, our culture of care and connection and curation and creativity and bringing all of those elements to life, but really doing that at scale. So we are um, well over a billion dollar business today. Um, we're working with thousands of advertisers. We continue to grow at a, at a rapid pace, but I like to say that I, I really do believe that we're just getting started um, in retail media and in, in Roundel specifically. Um, so your question about um, what surprises me, I think, you know, so I came over to Target after a pretty long career at Google and I was able to get lots of exposure to retailers and retail media networks when I was there. But I think what I learned coming in is I had very much like a tunnel vision around what my what my teams and my company's offerings could look like for a, for a retail media network. And now being in this seat, I understand the complexity. Um, there's a lot of complexity in our world of retail media, and I've applied that lens, of course, how do I to how I operate in my role um, leading the team, but also how I think about connecting with brands because they're managing through the same complexity that we are. Complexity and opportunity because they're we're really just scratching the surface of uh, its potential across all of these touch points. Uh, now, I recently worked on some research uh, that was kind of a big research effort this year, our CPG, Retail Media Network Benchmark Report that we published in September. Uh, we analyzed 14 different RMNs that served CPG brands um, across 13 different attributes of performance. Uh, Rondell did really well, ranking uh, number three overall in this report. So I'm curious to understand more from your perspective. You know, what do you think Rondell is particularly uh, delivering that's unique for brands? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would start with um, really thinking about the foundation of our business. Um, I mean, you've done a ton of research in this space. You know, starting a media company and a retailer is not an easy thing to do. Um, we've got history, right? We've been in this space for, for about 15 years now. And I think that foundation of tools, technology, people, understanding of the space is the, is the right foundation. Um, we operate at scale. We've got 165 million guests that brands can connect with via Roundel. And one of the things that I think has been really special, and I was lucky to be able to walk into it, is um, a lot of retailers are just now starting to think about, okay, I've got sponsored products on my site. How do I expand to have a um, uh, more breadth and offerings for brands to be able to connect with um, guests across their journey. Um, the Roundel's been um, really thinking about that from, from day one, right? How do we think about reaching somebody, um, you know, further up in the funnel as they're discovering uh, new brands or a new category all the way to when they're make making a purchase? So I think that foundation is important, but I would say even more important than that is, um, is how we think about bringing um, and continue to think about bringing all of the magic that is target to life in our offering. And I'll start where I where I started when you asked me the original question. It starts with the connection that we have with our guests. Um, we welcome about 50 million guests into our digital platforms every week, 30 million into our stores. And um, for anybody that shops at Target, I think you know that the connection that we have is really special and unique. Um, one of the things that's been coolest to me coming into this role is the stories that I hear from people about you know, their experiences with Target, how they feel, how they feel seen in our stores, the sense of joy and discovery. And we take that very seriously, right? That relationship. And so we take a different lens with how we think about connecting um, with, with guests. And we really take a lens of curation. And I think that lens of curation uh, uh, like results in better re results for the brands that we're working with. Um, how we're organized is different. I sit on the guest experience team. My leader is the chief guest experience officer. I sit around the table with a leader that oversees loyalty, uh, digital marketing tech, and we sit together at the table thinking about how we bring that guest experience to life. And that matters, right? It matters in the solutions that we put to market and the results that we deliver to brands. Um, and then it's our assets. So it's our values as a company, um, our organization and the assets that we have in our digital platform, our stores, um, our same day services, and then our circle program, which I think is you know really central to everything that we do in Roundel. Now, we talked about the pace of change in, in these markets, and, and certainly um, Roundel has picked up the pace in innovation. You've just unveiled uh, a slew of new product innovations. Um, can you walk us through a couple of, of the key ones? Sure. Maybe I'll give you, I'm going to give you like the very high level. And then if you have, if you want to go into any specifics, I'm happy to go into specifics. So um, 
The first one be, would be, I'll start here because I'll start with curation as um, one of our, our core values is um, we continue to expand on our programmatic by Roundel product, which is our, um, our programmatic, programmatic offering that allows brands to access our inventory and audiences on the DSP of their choice. Um, we just added a ton of new um, hand curated inventory into that um, into that offering. Uh, the second one is we're thinking about CTV. We know that's an important, um, a really important uh, tool for brands to be able to reach uh, reach our guests and reach shoppers. Um, we've been in this space and we're continuing to evolve uh, what our approach looks like here. We just launched a uh, really awesome new uh, shoppable format that makes it easier for guests to be able to um, to buy directly from from ads. And then last but not least, honestly, probably the thing that I'm most excited that we're working on is we um, are piloting our um, self-service buying solution. It's called Roundel Media Studio. We just started piloting it over the uh, over the course of the past few months with a handful of brands. Um, you can think of this as like the one-stop shop to access all of Roundel's uh, tools and services and solutions. Uh, we're starting with target product ads. That is our sponsored product solution, but we have plans to expand um, to other formats and inventory um, throughout the course of, of next year. Um, I'm excited about this because, you know, again, experience is really central to how Target thinks, and this is going to give us the opportunity to even own even more of the brand experience. Um, and it's also going to give smaller brands access to our media and our solutions, which I think is really important from a guest perspective, uh, because it's going to allow them to be able to explore um, and discover um, brands that they might not have been able to discover without us. So we're really excited about that. Again, pilot phase, um, lots more in store as we head into 2024 on that front. So one of the themes in a lot of what you mentioned there is this move up the funnel. Um, we're going to come back and talk about that in a moment, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, the foundations of of retail media and retail media networks. Um, I always look at it as you know, really high quality first party data that's used for audience targeting and closed loop measurement. Um, your foundation, or a big part of that, I would say, is the Target Circle loyalty program, which has over a hundred million members today. Um, and I think Target is somewhat unique, maybe among a very select few retailers that actually has the depth of both online and in-store purchase behavior, cross-category purchasing, and then you know the high-frequency behavior of buying in grocery and CPG, um, all tied to this massive loyalty program. Um, can you talk a bit more about Target's first-party data and, and how you're using it for um, you know targeting and and you know closed-loop measurement? Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think you honestly, like you hit um, some of the really key points, right? It starts with the scale that we have. So we've got 165 million guests um, overall that can be reached via Roundel, but 100 million of those are um, our target circle members. Um, we've got depth and really understand what matters to guests um, across categories. And I think, you know, the combination of the scale of that loyalty program um, plus the depth of um, of understanding across categories is something that's um, that's really really unique. I think when you talk about the circle program specifically, um, we kind of think about it um, as the hub of, of the personalization flywheel for Target, and it's frankly uh, a really important element of our future as a, as a retailer, but also as a as a media business. And so you've got scale. Um, but then you've got a, a lot of value in the in the in the guests that are that are part of the program. So um, on average, a, a circle member spends three times as much as a non-circle member. And so for a brand to be able to reach that guest, it's a it's a highly valuable guest. Um, but I would also argue that it's not just about reaching them; it's about reaching them with the right message. And um, guests and shoppers want promo. They want promos. They want deals. Um, we did some research this year and, and found that um, of our guests, um, over 80% of them would prefer to see a promo or a deal um, in their messaging from an advertising perspective. So we're really leaning into that. Um, if you just take the circle week that we that we just got uh, that we just had a few weeks ago, we did some testing for brands. And um, for brands that had a promo or did a circle week promo, um, it performs better for them too, right? So we saw that um, on average, a brand that had a promo, a circle promo, um, that ad performed um, from a ROAS perspective, 150, time, 150 times better than, um, than, a, than a brand that did not have a promo throughout the year. So we saw 150% increase in the return on ad spend, which is incredible. 
And then closed loop measurements. So that's important too. Um, obviously, you know, the, the data that we have is really important from an audience targeting perspective. It's really important to deliver personalization. It's also really important to be able to measure um, how, how trans, you know, what, what is leading to purchase behavior. And um, one of the things that's really unique about us is, um, you know, if you look at us as a retailer, we actually like the vast majority of our transactions are ha actually happening via credit card or the app. Um, but because we have a program that's of such scale and because guests are coming in and providing their credentials um, when they check out, even for cash transactions, we have a we have a good share of um, of uh, fidelity in terms of whether or not that's leading to a purchase behavior as well. And so overall, we're able to um, have visibility into well over 90 percent of transactions that are happening, which obviously provides a lot of fidelity in terms of our closed loop measurement. Yeah, and that's huge. It's not just the online purchases, but closing the loop with offline where so much of purchase activity still happens. Um, I want to shift to, to offsite media or those formats up the funnel. So display, video, uh, streaming TV. Um, in the in the CPG retail media benchmark that I referred to earlier, you rank number two in offsite targeting. Um, I'm curious, you know, what what are you doing differently that that brands seem to be picking up on? Yeah, I mean, I'll go back again, sort of where I started around what the philosophy of our um, approach has has looked like in Roundel historically, um, and the fact that we've always thought about that full journey and giving brands opportunity to connect with guests when they're ready to discover a new brand, when they're looking for you know a deeper connection with a brand they love, or when they're all the way down to making that final purchase. So we've always thought about that full funnel, and so I think in terms of breadth of um, offerings from social to influencer to CTV to search to you know you name it we've got um, we've got the formats and the platforms that I think brands are looking for um, and then I think the lens towards curation matters um, you know we don't we have a philosophy within our organization where we're not just going to kind of slap something up uh, wherever like we 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 think very thoughtfully about the places and spaces where it makes sense for for our brand to show up and for our partner brands to show up so I think the combination of those two things along with the scale of our of our audience offerings are what kind of brings the magic to life. And then you also mentioned um, your CTV offering, right? Bringing shoppable creative into this environment, um, which I get super excited about. Um, somebody uh, recently called it uh, CTV and retail media, the rising star of the sector. Um, it's bringing performance advertising into TV for the first time. Can you talk a bit more about uh, what your plans are there and how it yeah. works? Well, now I'm curious if you think the rising star is CTV or the store, because I think you think it's the store. If you oh, had to listen, I, it, you're asking me to choose between children or something. Your two favorite I, I don't know. children. They're all very exciting, but I'm very optimistic on both. And yes, in just a moment, we'll we'll wrap up with talking about the store. Awesome, we'd love to talk about that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're excited. We've been thinking a lot about CTV, and we do agree that it's one of the um, one of the rising stars and really important um, areas of focus for for retail media. Um, just to give you like a sense of what the, you know, I, I, I sort of seeded what we're doing. Um, the, the most recent thing that we've done is we've created a really cool experience for our guests where um, they can leverage a QR code to add a product um, directly into their cart for order pickup or, or drive up. And so what that does for great experience for a guest, right, to be able to access that very quickly um, for brands that allows them to continue to leverage our first party data for targeting, for measurement, but then also tap into and take advantage of our industry leading same day services, which is, um, uh, you know, driving, driving a lot of performance for brands. Um, we are excited about the opportunity to, again, think about CTV as um, something that can move more from like a passive um, uh, activity for, for guests into something that's more purchase oriented. And so taking a lens where we're thinking about the data, the measurement, and the creative as sort of like the winning um, proposition in CTV is something we're thinking about. And we're going to continue to, I think, shape what this looks like as we head into next year. Yeah, and it'll take some time for consumers to figure it out. But I think with low consideration products in particular in CPG, there's tons of potential here that's yet to be tapped. Speaking of untapped potential, uh, physical stores, right? So I've called this the next major media channel. There's massive scale in Target's case, a uh, unique reach of about 120 million shoppers a month, according to data from Placer AI. Um, do you think of it as a media channel? And is it something that can compete for national media dollars? And then 
how do you make sure that you navigate the tension between you know the sort of primacy of customer experience and you know the the usefulness of delivering ads in this context as well yeah yeah i mean i think that the the tension you mentioned is exactly that is exactly right um i mean it is for sure a, a big channel that that we're focused on i think in in the stores in particular the the how we do it is critically important. Anything that we do from a media perspective in the store is going to need to be um, truly additive to the overall guest experience. Um, we're thinking about screens, I think like everybody else, and we're doing um, a lot of testing on screens, but I, you know, what we're most excited about is how the guest is um, experiencing physical and digital together. And so we're pretty unique in that we've got, you know, our guests are leveraging our platforms in the store. So 75% of target guests are using the app or target.com when they're in the store. And then if you look at Z Gen Z guests um, in particular, um, that's 93%, right? So th those numbers are incredible. And that's such a phenomenal opportunity for us to be thinking about um, how do we dra drive that behavior um, and how do we help brands um, leverage that behavior to create really um, uh, fun opportunities uh, for guests and, and to truly surprise and delight, uh, delight our guests. Um, so we're testing and learning. You know that we're in the early innings, but we're excited to really think about how we continue to bring experiences to life that um, that enhance the overall guest experience. Sarah, thank you so much. This is all the time we have for our conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, next up, we have an analyst-led panel discussion on Gen Z with Jasmine Enberg. Please join her and her special guests next by clicking on the tab below the video that says next session. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going anywhere. I'll actually see you again at 105 Eastern for a panel discussion with three fantastic CPG brands on, you guessed it, retail media. Uh, I thank you and we will see you then.